in that moment, I realized every single time my parents made any decision that was supportive of me and not purely self-interested, that was a choice. That wasn't actually an obligation because the implication of there's no responsibility cloak is these are just people making choices. Welcome to Startup Dad, the podcast where we dive into the lives of dads who are also leaders in the world of startups and business. I'm your host, Adam Fishman, and in this episode, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Nick Soman. Nick is the founder and CEO of Decent Health, a company who's on a mission to provide affordable healthcare for everyone. Nick's journey through the tech world and his passion for healthcare, driven by his family's background in the medical field, led him to create a solution for small businesses to band together for better health insurance options. As a father of two young boys, Nick shares candidly about his struggles with juggling fatherhood, marriage, and entrepreneurship. So buckle up and join us for an engaging, raw, and insightful conversation with Nick Selman on Startup Dad. Welcome to Startup Dad. This is a time for me to interview various dads in the startup and business world, people who are building companies, people who are leading companies, people who are struggling as dads or as leaders. And I just want to have raw discussions with folks and hopefully help someone else out who might be going through some challenges or trying to figure out how to navigate this world as both a dad and a business leader. So Today, my guest, really excited to welcome him. He has been many things, started his career as a consultant, was a product manager on the Kindle, which we can all appreciate, started a company and sold it to Napster. Do you remember that thing? Did growth at Gusto, was an advisor, and now he is the founder and CEO of Decent, whose mission is to provide affordable health care for everyone. So, I would like to welcome Nick Selman to the show. Nick, welcome. How are you today? Thank you for having me here. I'm doing well. I'm all of those things that you talked about. I'm building a company, but first and foremost, I'm a dad and I'm raising two young boys who are eight and five. And Adam, I am struggling with all of it. So I'm really excited (laughs) to talk to you about all of it. Awesome. Well, why don't we start with a little bit more about you and your background? So Give me the Eli five explanation of decent to tell me like I'm a five year old or like you're explaining it to one of your kids. How do you talk about decent to them? Absolutely. So I'll take that Eli five construct. Five year olds are sort of like really small companies on a playground. (laughs) And if you wanted to create really a great outcome as a very small company, one thing five year olds learn pretty quickly is you want to team up with all the other five year olds and then you can create better outcomes for yourself. And indeed, What Decent does is we band together lots and lots of small companies so they can create one big group and they can get affordable health insurance to the tune of 35 to 40 percent off ACA compliant comprehensive health insurance with a net promoter score of 79 versus the industry average of 19. We're building what I believe is a really compelling service for all small businesses as a replacement to traditional crappy health insurance. Cool. So kind of like when I was at a company when it was really small. And then every year as we grew, the health insurance got a little bit better because our bargaining power improved. You're trying to help companies at the very earliest stage basically improve their bargaining power, essentially. That's a great way to put it. And also kind of offer just a better experience like the big companies get. Very cool. I'm excited about what you're doing. And it's not nationwide, right? Because healthcare is very tricky, like state by state. So where do you offer services today? For the last four years, We've been in Texas. I have an exciting exclusive for Startup Dad, which is that I'm currently working on the strategy doc that enumerates our plans for a national rollout next year. So it's working in Texas. I hope to bring it to 47 other states or so very soon. That's amazing. That's amazing. Tell me a little bit about your background. You've had an interesting journey to get to this. What is it about healthcare? What is it about all the work that you did before that kind of like, prepared you to do this now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to take you way back. So when I was a kid, I grew up as the child of two primary care doctor parents. I have a primary care doctor sister. I have primary care doctor aunts and uncles and grandparents. And at some point somewhere, there's a surgeon, but we don't talk about him. 
I'm the only one in my family who's not in healthcare. Okay. And that path was, you know, very available to me growing up. I think there was some expectation that's the path that I would go down. But as a kid, what I saw was my parents who worked in 30 years each in primary care and then became the medical leadership of a large HMO called Group Health Cooperative with about 650,000 members in the Seattle area. I watched them get more frustrated with their jobs over time. And they'd say things to me and my little sister, like, this is the worst time to become a doctor in the last 50 years. I remember being about 14 years old when my dad came home from a day at the HMO. And at that point, he was the chief medical executive. So he's in charge of all the doctors and the hospitals. He had a counterpart on the insurance side, and he's pretty soft-spoken. But I remember him sitting down at the dinner table and saying, I just don't think my counterpart on the insurance side of this business cares about the patient. So those are all the reasons mm -hmm. I didn't become a doctor, Adam. Those are all the mm -hmm. reasons that I found my way into entrepreneurship instead. And I think you could look at my career and it's been, oh, shoot, I thought I knew what I was going to do, but it turns out it's not going to be that because of all these things that I heard from my parents growing up. So I got into tech and, you know, I started at Amazon, had a couple of really fun jobs there, knew that I was interested in entrepreneurship and ended up spinning out and building something. I sort of discovered growth, which is how you and I first intersected. Yeah. Because I needed to find a way to scale the consumer business and was able to crack a referral strategy to the tune of about 50,000 new members a day at peak. And I thought, wow, the experimentation aspect of this is really fun. There's this creative balance of, you know, the coming up with ideas, but then there's the math behind what will actually work. Really like that. Ended up being able to build and lead the growth team at Gusto. That was a really fun job. Knew I wanted to get back out and be a founder again. And a little bit like the Lethal Weapon movies, you know, just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. I ended up looking at my own problems and I left Gusto and immediately started paying more for health insurance than for rent for my family of four in Sausalito yeah. and thought, what is going on? And that became the problem that's kind of been my obsession for the last five years. Wow. What did your parents think when you didn't go into medicine? I mean, I guess like my dad was also a doctor and he's an ears, nose and throat surgeon, retired now. He used to come home and complain endlessly about the life of a doctor and had the same like, don't ever be a doctor. Don't go do what I'm doing. So did your parents like actively steer you away from it? Or were they kind of like, well, of course he's going to be a doctor. And then they were hugely disappointed in you when you didn't follow in their footsteps. No, nobody's ever asked me this. And it's a really smart question. I think it's a balance. I think what they thought was going to happen was I would inherit some of their frustrations about the profession, but I would still decide to go down that road. And that isn't what happened. I listened to them maybe more than I've ever listened to them about anything and said, forget that. And it went down a different road. And I, they're proud of me. I have good parents and I have secure attachment with my parents to quote a book called Hold Me Tight that we're going to talk about a little bit later. I knew that what I did was less important to them than who I was. They still don't understand entrepreneurship, but I think they've been sure. really proud to see me come back into healthcare. And then about once a year, like clockwork around the holidays, I get a long email from my dad that's how not to be a fucking insurance executive. And it's usually a list of bullet points of like, proud of you, keep building, don't do this shit. So like any parent, it's this combination of this love and this pride, but also some strong guidance along the way. Awesome. That's really great. And I love that annual email from your dad. I mostly get screenshots of the newspaper or like photos of the Detroit Free Press where my dad is when he'll be like, hey, did you hear this thing about Lyft? You know, where I used to work. And he calls and asks me for stock tips. What do you think is going to happen with that Lyft oh, stock? Man. And I'm like, Dad, I haven't worked there since 2014. So I really, I don't know. I'm not an insider. <laughs> and if I was, I couldn't give you this information. So yes, um, yes. Let's turn to talk about you and your family. You have a partner and two kids. I yeah. do. Yeah, my wife Anna is my partner. Two kids, Boone, who's eight years old, and Ben, who's five years old. Okay, cool. Your kids are very similar age to mine, which are nine and seven. I have a girl and a boy. We both married up in life. I think we agree on that for sure. Your partner seems like a lovely woman. It seems like the two of you have a lot of fun. I was doing some Facebook stalking now yeah. that we're Facebook friends, you know? Yeah, I would agree with all of that. That's all real. <laughs> so tell me, what was your decision like for you to start a family? What were you doing, you know, eight or nine years ago when you were like, it's kid time? Did yeah. you have to get drags kicking and screaming to this decision? Was this something you had talked about with her for a long time? Walk me through that. You told me you wanted raw and candid, so I'm going to deliver against yeah. that. And no, I didn't need to get kicking and screaming to have children. I did 
to some degree need to get kicking and screaming to get married. I think that was the hurdle for me. I'd mm-hmm. always had this, you know, belief in this concept that I did want kids. I wasn't, you know, 100% sure from 10 years old, but that part really clicked. I think it took me a while to decide it was time to get married. And, and that was where I appreciate Anna. And, you know, as you get to know Anna, you'll be able to hear her saying this. I remember starting to date her and I had been dating around and just sort of thinking, hey, this is pretty cool. I could just hang out and just date for a while and not get married for a while. <laughs> and she was resistant to my charms <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. And I just got really curious about her and sort of interested in her because it wasn't easy. And I remember at some point being the one that broached the conversation, I was like, I think we should be exclusive with each other. And she said, what's in it for me? And I remember, being, oh, dang. <laughs> I like her even more now. Yeah, right. you'll really like her. And I was intrigued by that. And ultimately, you know, there are many wonderful qualities about my wife, but I decided, you know, I think it is time, despite, you know, that there's part of me that would like another five, 10 years. What happened with the kid thing that was pretty interesting was we thought we had more time, which is, I think, a big lesson in life in general. We figured, you know, hey, we're going to just, you know, start trying, but like not in a really structured way or formal way. And then we'll probably have like a year, you know, some period of time, maybe a couple of years. The joke that we make internally is it was one shot, one kill. Like we got together, we decided we would stop, you know, the goalie and immediately she was impregnated. And I have some perverse pride in this, Adam. I think I'm two for two on one shot, but we never had that time where it was like, you know what, we're just going to be married and not have children. In fact, at our wedding party, she was visibly pregnant. And oh, uh, wow. And so it was immediate. And I knew that I wanted it, but I didn't expect it to happen so fast. Yeah. Well, I think on the one hand, like unexpected, you know, speed. On the other hand, pretty fortunate that it worked out like that, because I know so many people that struggle with fertility issues and takes them a really long time. And that can be really tough on a relationship. You're probably not the norm of what most people experience. Actually, it's kind of the opposite. I think that's probably true. And I think like so many things, it's great if you can survive the challenging early times. And there were some really challenging early times where I was you know, trying to start a company and trying to become a father and a, a husband at the same time. And that was really hard. Having gotten through that, I'm happy to not be an old dad. I guess I'll call yeah. it that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm capable of keeping up with my kids. I think given how everything turned out, it was lucky. But there was some yeah. time, man, where it was like, I, I don't know if you had this experience, but some combination of like, holy shit, I didn't know I was signing up for all of this. And like, actually, aren't we going to make it? And that could be anything from, is my marriage going to make it? Is my company going to make it? I always get we're going to make it because there's laws against that kind of thing. But uh, that was that was a balance that was hard to strike in the early days. And I'd say I'm still learning, but it has gotten a lot better. Yeah, I'm curious, what were you doing professionally when your older son was born? Like when you first became a dad, where were you working? What did you do? Like were you at a startup then, like an earlier stage? I was. I, I was at my first startup. And there's a couple of interesting wrinkles to that story. So I I had started dating Anna, who would become my wife. And we both decided to leave our jobs at the same time. So she was working (laughs) in a variation of pharmaceutical sales or chemical sales. And I was working at Amazon. And I decided I want to start a company. And she decided she was just not feeling her current job and was interested in doing something different. And I went and bought her a bunch of magazines so she could make a dream work board because we live in Mill Valley and my wife's kind of woo-woo and I love that about her. And still kind of early in our time dating each other, I wake up in my apartment one morning and I come out and she's sitting at a chair at the kitchen table and she's got all these pictures of babies like laid out in front of her. And I knew she'd been dream boarding. She wanted to do next. And absolutely, that was my reaction. I was like, oh my God, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm ready for all this. It turned out that she was interested in becoming a doula is at least the, you know, oh, she looks that all up. And so she did that for a while. I was working on a startup and I got to say, just to be self-critical for a minute, I was not a good dad for like the first year or two of my older son's life. I think I felt like I was drowning. I had a co-founder who is a bit older than me and was giving me all the right mentorship, but like so much mentorship, it 
it takes making your own mistakes and then like several years of lag time to actually click. But I think, I hate to say it, you know, Boone had a pretty difficult birth. We tried to have a home birth and it was really a fraught situation. I think I went back to work like two or three days after that and I would give myself a D minus for, you know, the first year or two of figuring out you know, how to be a dad. And I really think, you know, I want to think that I've gotten better since then, but I had no idea how to balance. I know you're going to ask me about balancing and I think I've gotten better over time. I remember feeling like, you know, Boone was born and I loved him immediately. He's got this, you know, bright red hair, which was a hit surprise to everybody. Same. Not so I'm bright good. anymore, but he's got, he's got the really big red stuff. I'm yeah. holding it in my arms and I had two thoughts sequentially. I was like, oh shit, it's just me and, and this kid. Like I, I had sort of envisioned some metaphorical responsibility cape that was going to light on my shoulders and, you know, I would step into a new realm of presence and all of that. None of that shit happened. It was me and a kid. That was sort of terrifying to me. And then the second piece, which was more constructive, I realized, and this is a corny thing, but it, it was meaningful to me. In that moment, I realized every single time my parents made any decision that was supportive of me and not purely self-interested, that was a choice. That wasn't actually an obligation because the implication of there's no responsibility cloak is these are just people making choices. And I actually started crying and I called my dad and my mom and I said, hey, my son is born and I also want to thank you because I don't think I got it until right now at this moment, all yeah. of the decisions you made that there's no parent cops. I mean, I guess there is if you get really bad, but you know, nobody shows up at yeah. your door and tells you to do it. And that, that was meaningful. And I think I'm um, really thankful for my wife and for my children. The good news is that at really young ages, I believe that the kids need their mother more than they need their father around things like biology and, you know, mm -hmm. co-sleeping and all that stuff. So I was able to get really good by the time they were, you know, toddlers. And at that point, my wife was like, there is so much masculine energy in this house. I don't know what to do with myself. And so I, I needed to be good. <laughs> and I was able to figure it out. Yeah, we have a lot of friends who have a house full of boys. And it's, you know, I don't want a gender stereotype, but it's a different vibe, right? So it's a pretty different vibe. What's it like for you? Was there any surprises going from, is it from a boy to a girl or from a girl to a boy? Girl to a boy, yeah. So from a girl to a boy without you know, breaking any rules that are going to get us in trouble. Yeah, Were there yeah. anything, even about your own feelings, having a daughter and then having a son, any difference? Yeah, let's see. I'm not great at the feelings stuff. Any, any, uh, any KPIs? <laughs> yeah, it's exactly, exactly. You know, girls mature way faster than boys. And so they mm -hmm. do things at a younger age than, than boys do. And so actually, I think like having had our daughter first and then raising our son, I would look at certain milestones and I'd be like, is something wrong with him? Like he's not yeah. talking yet. You know, he's not doing this yet. And of course the pediatrician like talked me back from a ledge every time and was like, no, he's fine. Okay, there's a range of times when kids do these things. And so I think it's just a big difference. And they're just into very different things. I mean, like without us trying, my daughter is way more into crafting and paint and art and dolls and you know cooking and things like that not to say that those are particularly female activities because i do a lot of that stuff in our house but my son is into like video games and watching game streamers and putting mentos in a bottle of coke and having it explode everywhere and like you know he's just into <laughs> that stuff he's much more physical right yeah. yeah, the mentals and coke yeah. thing is like a constant delighter. I I, I want to be conscious of not saying things that are wrong or getting in any trouble. It is interesting yeah. that somebody that's grown up at a time when when you look at that balance of nature and nurture, nurture's really been taking the cake from a social cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. And there have been some undeniable things. And I think I can navigate us to safe ground here as dads <laughs> that it's just like, oh, there's a nature thing here too. An example that has nothing to do with gender and that I remember you ever played the video game Altered Beast growing up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. These, you know, Roman warriors that rose from yep. the grave and then they would become these werewolves and these monsters. They were super ripped, which as a kid, I was like, oh, my body's going to look like that when I'm 10. And I was wrong. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the thing that I remember is being in my wife's car and we were at a gas station and Boone, my young son at the time, probably two years old, is just sleeping in the back. 
And somebody started to kind of lumber towards the car, like not in a weird way, but in a way that if you've been at a gas station in America at nighttime, you've probably had this experience a hundred mm-hmm. years. And I felt this like, <laughs> like rising up in my chest, like I was ready to stop. And that's an example of where, you know, I have an idea of who I am and how I relate to the world. And then I have unmistakable evidence that there's some other biological shit going on that I don't even understand. And I find that to be an interesting lens through which to, to look at parenting. I don't think I have ever had a conversation with somebody on parenting where they brought up Altered Beast. Um, <laughs> that's, we're, like going deep, we're going deep in the archives on that one. That's a deep well, cut. Adam, aren't we ultimately just all Altered Beast? This, this is true. Very meta of you. Now I'm going to go like look up how I can play that game again. It's a pretty great game. Remember. <laughs> so like would you put that in the category of most surprising things you discovered as a dad like that seems like that was like a primal like yeah. i didn't know i had this in me yeah it, that was a big big unlock and then the other one and this people will tell you this but you still don't i didn't get it you can say whatever you want they notice what you do and they notice yeah. everything and yeah my younger both of them are observing my younger son who's five in particular is incredibly observant and it's a little painful to realize i remember as an example and i i love my family i tell them that i love them i hug them i'm very affectionate as a dad and i get up in the morning and go to work and (laughs) now less so and that's been beautiful to be able to work from home more but i had this really difficult interaction for me because you know while back i get up and i'm playing with my kids a little bit and they know that I'm going to leave and go out the door. And my son says, I don't like it when you go to work because every time you go to work, you're picking work over me. And it was such a true statement, if I'm Uh being completely honest. And it, and it really got me. And that was an example of like, I could talk to them about family values. I could talk to them about how I love them and I'm so proud to be their dad and all those things are true. And they notice what I choose. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the old adage, do as I say, not as I do? That was like the parent mantra from when we were growing up, right? And uh, that's terrible mantra. <laughs> it's just false. It's just like patently false. Like kids are a mirror uh, of what you model for them. I learned this in parenting class. I still don't always do a great job of it, but like you have yes. to be so just like stoic all the time, you know, around your kids and calm. I mean, obviously you want them to see you know, when things are going well or not going well, you can't hide things from them. Yeah. But like they pick up on the most subtle things and they hold it in their brain forever. And they will I, like bring it back up a year later in conversation. Remember when you did that, dad? And I'm like, oh my God, you remember things that you said? Uh, I'll give you a positive example of this because where I've struggled, I wasn't like a super well-behaved kid growing up. And mm-hmm. then I became like a camp counselor and I always had a soft spot for sort of the troublemaking kids more so than like the, the tattletale kids. Like, I think when Boone was four years old, he realized that like, don't be a narc is like a summon family value. And he had... <laughs> but Ben, the younger one, the most recent Christmas we had in Mill Valley, he disappears. We can not find him for about seven minutes. It wasn't long. In that time, he goes downstairs. He discovers all the presents that we've tried to hide in the basement. He unwraps oh. a bunch of the presents. He eats a bunch of the candy that was supposed to be in the stockings. He takes a skateboard that was a planned, you know, Christmas gift. He rides the skateboard down the street and then our doorbell rings because he's being picked up by a cop who brought him back. And this is my five-year-old kid. And honestly, just like I know you might be thinking right now, I'm like trying to keep it together. And like, yeah, from an objective perspective, this is one of the more severe violations that I've ever you know, seen from my son. From a human and my personality perspective, it was awesome. And he could tell, even as I'm trying to chastise him, that I like secretly kind of like wanted to high five him the whole time. I didn't, I really tried to keep it together, but they can tell that too. So like you actually have to mean what you say because I ultimately had to step back and I knew my wife was more upset than I was. So I was like, I need you to handle this one because part of me is just like high-fiving myself over and over that this is my child. (laughs) (laughs) It's also like kids do something that is like, you know, is wrong, but it's really funny. Yeah. You know, and you like, you like have to just like hold it in and you, and then they see you kind of like chuckling and they're like, but you're laughing. I means I should do more of this. You're like, no, don't. No, it's just really like, you're like, uh, no. And, and, you know, I know we we're going to talk a little bit about dissonance between uh, partners because that's a thing too. Yeah. This is where our tribal stuff kind of kicks in. Like my family upbringing, I was comfortable with a high level of chaos. And my wife, Anna, who 
is wonderful, was less comfortable with that level of chaos. And, and my kids are like chaos personified. And so I have found <laughs> that it's not good to have a single good cop and bad cop in the relationship, but we really have found that it's better when we pick our spots. And uh, this is like a, a very blunt object, but more often than not, it, it actually makes sense for one person to be doing the primary parenting. And if the other person is not able to be completely and fully present, like actually leave the room yeah. and trade off and in, in who's going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. We do that a lot in my house because we realize sometimes it's actually easier, you know, one person to focus on. And so you brought that up about your partner. Anna, and I think, you know, partnership is super important when you have kids, like yeah. parenting philosophies, like figuring out all that stuff kind of ahead of time. But I feel like not enough people do it. And it ends up being, you know, inevitably you bring different philosophies to the relationship, you bring different baggage, you bring different upbringings and parenting styles that you were raised with. So I'm curious, what are some things that like you and your wife don't agree on when it comes to parenting? What's some of the conflict that comes up? A lot of it is related to food. And I, I'm going to just concede the point to her objectively. My wife is really healthy. She was a semi-pro speed skater. And oh, you know, so wait, uh, se semi-pro speed skater, doula, She's like a, a renaissance woman. This like, yeah, uh, yeah, no, she, she's, yeah. she's quite badass, but you know, she'll take me out on the slopes and she can easily ski a black diamond and I will literally just fall down. And so that's, you know, that's our relationship in some ways. And when it yeah. comes to food, we really have different perspectives on food. I think I can express this in a way that there's not a clear right answer for her. Food is mostly fuel. And, you know, mm -hmm. you want to take in the healthy fuel to fuel your F1 race car. You know, to me, food is a lot of things. And among the better ones, I think it's pleasure, it's connection, mm -hmm. it's breaking bread with people, it's exclaiming delight as you bite into something delicious. And that's really a, a truly hard balance in our house because she'll say, you know, hey, I want to keep the boys healthy and make sure that they have what they need to have the active lifestyle that they have it yeah. in general. And I'll say, yes, and, you know, they haven't had pizza in like six months and like, let's actually do this. Or more problematically, we're going to this kid's birthday party and there's going to be a huge tub of ice cream and we need to decide like what's in bounds and what's not. So that's mm -hmm. a problem we have. We have conflict. Yeah, it's funny. Let me tell you where we don't have conflict. Sure. Well, almost anything that's not related to our own childhoods and our own upbringing, we have to remember that we're in this fog of war of being parents of early stage kids and something that might feel like a fight at the time, if we could just get away from our children for 30 minutes and sit down and understand where each other are coming from, we can pretty much resolve almost anything. And I'm jumping around a little bit, but one thing that I have learned that I got as parenting advice, but I have adapted over time to marriage advice. I had a bunch of people try to tell me stupid shit that I either didn't understand or I didn't agree with about becoming a parent. And like, I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. And there's no way that I could have adapted if I had. But one person said one smart thing to me, which is, hey, when you've got this new baby, your temptation is going to be to focus on the baby because it's the new thing. What you really need to do is you need to focus on your wife, Nick, and your wife's going to focus on the baby. And by the transitive property, the baby's going to benefit. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's even a heteronormative thing. I think it makes sense to have a partner that is establishing that early bond with the baby. And then, okay. at least for me, way, way, way more productive and helpful and useful to be leveraging my energy into making sure my wife had what she needed. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think I probably forgot that when the boys turned four and was like, cool, well, I don't have to worry about that anymore. It's still true. And I think this connects to that idea of what they see it's really tempting to focus on that relationship between me and each of them. Guess what? Their model for a love relationship is everything they see between me and my wife. And so we've actually started to kind of openly say like, you know, Anna, you are the one who is most important to me and you children are incredibly important, but I really need to make sure she has what she needs. And I might not actually completely believe that. Like I really fucking love them so much. And I think about them today. <laughs> But it's good for them to see that, that they're not, yeah. you know, star around which everything resolves. And the better we get along, which hasn't always been easy, the better we get along, the more I see them growing in the light of a healthy marriage. And for us, it's important. Yeah, I want to spend some time on what you just said there, which is like, it hasn't always been easy. And I find yeah. that like the presence of children, 
really can introduce a lot of new dynamics. It can stir up all kinds of like feelings and weird baggage that people didn't know they had. And you mentioned also getting away for like a half hour to get on the same page. I find that one thing that kids are fantastic at is interrupting adult conversation. (laughs) When you're like trying to have even just a moment of like exchange with your partner and the kids are like, but dad, dad, dad. Yeah. Exactly. What do you and Anna do to like recharge and like create that space so that you can get time to have an adult conversation that's not being interrupted 46,000 times? Two things that I would call out because it's really difficult. I'm becoming more militant about date night. I -hmm. used to think it was a cool, nice to have that would help you maintain the strength of your relationship. Now it's literally a reprieve from, you know, the day to day war. There's a second thing we do, though, that's, that's actually really interesting. Andy Johns wrote a really good article uh, about knowing when to stop. I don't know if you read that. It's got yeah. a fun exercise in it where you create these concentric circles that are zones of tolerance. And so the center one is outside tolerance. I never want these things to be happening. The middle one is sort of borderline. And then the third one is, well, what does it look like when you're flourishing? And Anna and I actually turned that into a couple's exercise. So we each built one of those. And every Sunday, you know, this is so corny because I'm totally talking about like a co-founder team progress meeting. Every Sunday, we hand each other our zone of tolerance sheet and we read from the inside out and sort of say, hey, Anna, has there been instances of you feeling, you know, lonely and disconnected this week? And if the answer is no, then we move on. If the answer is yes, we come up with like one thing that we're going to do to try to adapt it for the following week. That's been a really good level setting exercise for us. We try to really hand the kids to grandparents more. And then another thing this gets to that balance of work and parenting, like I can't go as hard as I used to because I was almost killing myself in my first startup because I think I had insecurity and I was working in a difficult space anyway in consumer social. And Mm -hmm. I was like, well, my solution is going to be that I literally like fall asleep with my hand on the keyboard about 50% of nights. And I really did. And that's as much as anything why I was not a dad to my own, you know, level of quality for the first couple of years is because I was just feeding myself to the work monster. And that's been a big positive change. You're analytical and I hide it better, but I am too. Like, I don't know. I don't know if my actual output is better. I know I'm happier and I know my family is happier and my business seems to be doing well when I don't, you know, feed myself to the work monster as much. And that same co-founder who's a little older that I'd mentioned who used to tell me, you know, hey, I, your co-founder Richard, have irrevocable guidelines around my family. Every year we go to Priest Lake for a week and that's a thing that's going to happen. I'm not going to work on nights and weekends unless you need me to on a specific project. Like all those rules that honestly used to piss me off, man, because when you're at an early stage and you're like, well, we're co-founders and I feel like I'm working harder than you, it's a terrible feeling. In this second shot on goal and this business feels categorically different in a lot of ways. I'm just adapting his, you know, his habits and my family's a lot better off because of it. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. I think it's like a point of maturity, right? Like as you get older and you, you reassess what's important to you and you realize that like the Silicon Valley hustle culture Uh isn't particularly friendly to anyone who wants to have a family and be present for that family, right? Like certainly not for moms and people who birth children. We definitely know that. But also, like, there's still somewhat of a stigma around being an involved parent here. I think it's really, even for people that aren't parents, I find that culture to be increasingly toxic. It's so male dominated. There's a really obvious logical issue of, wow, if you're spending as much time working as you say you are. Who's writing these really long and involved LinkedIn posts? Because it can't be you. <laughs> That is a little Who's bit of doing language. the thought leadership. Who's doing yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow, you must be working so hard. There's yeah. one other thing though, because I think I escaped that trap, but I fell into another one more okay. recently. And this is something that took some time to unravel. Anna and I were having a really good conversation about these when we were working to get this off the ground. And we happened to pick Texas as a launch state and Austin as a launch mm-hmm. city for a lot of reasons that in retrospect were, were pretty good, but I was really, really excited about this new business and I was really worried about our first sales season a couple of years ago. And I was talking to Anna and she actually had the idea. She's like, hey, I just realized like if you're going to be sitting here 
hoping the company can hit the thresholds it needs to hit to raise another round of financing and knowing that you could be more effective if you were actually on the ground in Texas talking to these companies, like, should we move there? That was the first question. And I was like, wow, what a amazing wife I have that, that she would ask yeah. me that question. And I said, well, gosh, let's go out there together and see what it feels like to be out there. And we did go out there together and we even thought about moving there long term, but couldn't quite figure out things like school for the kids yeah. and wanted to be kind of close to family on the West Coast. We're in Austin where I remember we were sitting at the Barton Springs, beautiful day. You know, my wife is really gorgeous and I'm sitting out and there's the sun shining down on us. And she goes, gosh, I just realized if you're going to be out here stressed out and working your butt off and I don't know anyone, like, are you just going to be working your ass up all the time? And I'm just going to be kind of alone and bummed out. And I was yeah. like, again, yeah, like th th this yeah. is all right. And I pointing to her here because she was the one that had these insights that turned out to be right. The upshot of all of this is I thought it was a good idea for me to basically move for a year to Austin, Texas with the occasional trip home, not as often as you think. Well, there was a really bad thing and a really good thing. The really bad thing, which is somewhat obvious, is, is Adam, that, that almost killed my marriage. Like mm -hmm. it was a strain. I was working really hard. I wasn't there for her. I'm not really good on the phone. And so that became a struggle for us. Yeah, same. Um, It was a really good thing too. And what I compare it to was the Christmas story movie where Scrooge gets a chance to see what his life might've been like in a variety of different circumstances. I was living with my VP of marketing. He's about 10 years younger, fun social guy. And at that you know, point in his life was single and was really just enjoying Austin and having a lot of fun yeah. and you know, working hard, but partying pretty hard too. I had an opportunity to kind of say like, okay, this is what it would feel like to be in my late 30s, early 40s and have that be my life. And I really missed my family. And yeah. I don't think I could have had that level of clarity without actually kind of living the counterfactual for a little bit. So from that perspective, yeah. I did come home with some fixing to do. And it was in a really weird way. There was a silver lining of COVID in that it allowed me to spend time with my family and be with them. And it really had helped us heal up our marriage. But I had a chance to see the grass on the other side of the fence and I didn't want it. Um, yeah. And I think that was really important. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sometimes you got to kind of go on your, you know, your walkabout in order to <laughs> figure out what matters and kind of get that experience. We'll call it an experiment because we like to do that. Ah, I like that. That's well, yeah, yeah it, it was a it was, uh, experiment. Clear, clear favor of the null hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a couple more questions. How many people does decent employ? Like how big 50. is the company? 50 people. That's a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like throughout this conversation, you've kind of managed to strike a pretty good balance, like of being present for your family, but also being a leader of a company, how do you communicate or demonstrate that to your employees so they feel the same sort of, you know, ability to do that? How do you bring that into the culture of your business? It's a good question. And I would start with the hypothesis that who is on your team matters a hell of a lot more than what you say to them. And so yeah. I've got a trick that I do. And at some point, I'll find a smarter and less legally fraught way to explain my trick. But what I would say is without this being about age, we hire grownups at Decent. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. we hire people that don't need constant oversight, that are self-motivated enough that yeah. it's not going to be about what their manager says to them. It's going to be about their threshold for a good job. So then the role of the manager is not to instill motivation, but instead to provide guidance, unblock, you know, give guiding information, et cetera. None of the shit that I'm going to tell you would work if we didn't mm -hmm. mainly focus on hiring the right people who don't need to be parented at work. And because we hire those people, I'm in this delightful place where I've never been before. <laughs> and I maybe tested this stuff because I do run experiments, Adam. Nobody, nobody on Decent wants to hear me talk about how hard I work and how much work there is to do. And, you know, yeah. if we just hustle a little bit harder, like they'll literally zoom smack me in the face if I start doing that. <laughs> but because of the people we've hired, I get to go the opposite direction. So I just shared something on Slack, I think two days ago. I was realizing this is going to be my last opportunity to jump in the water with my kids before we leave Washington for the summer because it's going to get more colder. I just lacked everybody and I was like, hey, I'm peeling out you know, a few hours early because this is what I'm going to go do. Everything is a test. It's also authentic to me. I actually was going to go do that, but they love that shit. And, and two or three years ago, I would have been afraid to say that because I, oh, am I you know, permitting people to put other things ahead of work? 
the, the truth is they're going to do that anyway, and they should do that anyway. And so I'm trying to be to my coworkers what my co-founder for so long has been to me, which is an example of somebody trying, sometimes failing, but really making an earnest effort to find balance. And what I yeah. find is that there's nothing magical there. I'm treating them like peers and I'm treating yeah. them with honesty and they respond a hell of a lot better than that than, you know, hierarchical whip driving. Yeah. Yeah. And it, much like with your kids, you're modeling the behavior that you want to encourage them to do. So I, I do. And, and the hard thing, and you and I both know it, is you've decided that that's what you want them to do. And then when they do it, you have to be like, great. Even if yep. you're like, oh, <laughs> we want you to get that one thing done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, you have to. I mean, it's a two way street. You've got to do that because you can't penalize or punish them for doing what you would do it, you know, in that situation. That's right. So. Okay, I want to wrap with one last question, then we'll do some rapid fire. Tell me about a mistake that you've made as a father. We've made many, yeah. right? So tell me one that like you really remember very vividly. Oh, I'm going to go there. I mean, there are a few like because I've made a lot, but I spanked my kids, which I don't think is some boom moment, but I'm going to tell you why it was a mistake. And there was a lead up to it. So my younger son, just for a really long time, he would not go to bed. That was the issue we were having. And I would try yeah. everything that I could figure out to try to get him to go to bed. And he actually started to like it. It started out as sort of a joke. I was like, you know, you need to go to bed or I'm going to send you to Le Spank Le Bâton. And I would yeah. say it in this very corny French accent. And then that yeah, involves, yeah. Uh, you know, you need to go to bed or I'm going to send you to this little town in France. And he would laugh. And it was a joke that we had between us, but I was not getting the output that I wanted. I wanted him to fucking go to bed. Instead, he's like laughing. <laughs> we're joking about listening to my phone. And at some point, I broke that wall a little bit. And I was like, he won't go to bed. He won't go to bed. I'm actually going to spank him. And to be really honest, I don't know. Maybe there are good circumstances in which case, in a rare occasion, it would make sense to spank your kids. There's lots of evidence suggesting it shouldn't be your go-to. A fair amount suggesting you shouldn't do it at all. I'm not the master of all the right answers. I'll tell you sure. why I knew it was wrong. Because I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> and, and and it was like I realized because when you're a parent you really should be guiding towards the outcome you want I got myself to a point where I was so frustrated that if I'm being really honest on the Startup Dad podcast I was like I'm going to give him like a, a good little whack on his butt I'm never going to try to hurt my kid I'm not taking yeah. a belt or anything like that but I, I was like it was a revenge spank rather than a truly you know guided yeah. spank and, and I think the reason that was a mistake was one I don't ever want to be in a position where I'm taking pleasure from my child's suffering. And yeah. I think I, I was so frustrated in that moment. It wasn't a thing that just happened once, probably happened five times. But I realized I, I need to make a bright line and just not be doing this because that isn't healthy. And you can be frustrated with your kids, but guess what? Whatever the behavior you're getting, you know, you can either look at it as it's your fault, literally, biologically, it's your fault. Or you could look at it as it's not going to change unless you find a productive way to change it. And right. that was one piece. And then another piece is, you know, he briefly, you know, started not wanting me to do bedtime because one out of five times it was it was turning into that outcome. And this comes back to that book that I'd mentioned, this book, Secure Attachment, which was it's the best read I've, I've found on parenting because it's so simple. You really want to cultivate this feeling of secure attachment in your children, which is no matter what happens, I am loved because the opposite is insecure attachment where it becomes conditional or it's, well, daddy will love me if I do this, or I'm safe here if I do this. And that's the one time in my time as a parent that I can remember kind of creating a feeling that my kid wasn't safe. And that was a real mistake. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for the vulnerability there. I appreciate it. And I think like if somebody says that they don't get frustrated with their kids, I mean, they're lying, right? Because like yeah. kids job as they're learning is to like test the fences, right? Like, yes, test the fences. Well. like, oh, well, well, see if I get shocked. You know, it's like the raptors in Jurassic Park. <laughs> so I appreciate you sharing that with me. And that's a really, you know, valuable lesson. I think for people who have ever done that before and then felt incredibly guilty afterwards, yes. like, you know, it happens, right? And I think learning from it, and like you mentioned, you want your kids to have secure attachment and sort of learning what that looks like is pretty, pretty long-term valuable for your relationship with your kids. So, so thanks for sharing. All right. For sure. We've just got a few minutes left. So let's do our rapid fire round. I want you to tell me the first thing that comes to your mind when I ask you this question. So try mm -hmm. not to hesitate and let's go. Okay. So most indispensable parenting product you've ever purchased. Mm. We bought Ben a tent 
because the ultimate resolution of him not being willing to sleep was putting him in a little tent that we could zip up. And that was an absolutely killer purchase. Awesome. Most useless parenting product you've ever purchased. Oh, God. Anything in the category of you need to buy this or your kid won't be safe because it didn't work and I felt like a fucking idiot. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so many things, too. Parenting purchases are primarily motivated by fear. <laughs> Okay, which one of your kids is your favorite? <laughs> uh, my favorite is whichever one needs me more at the time. And Excellent answer. Changes. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever drop one of your kids as a baby? I didn't drop one of my kids as a baby, but I have been witness to a bunch of really stupid shit like my child disappearing in a supermarket and no parent wants to admit this, but 80% of your brain is like, I got to find my child. The other 20% is like, oh my God, I'm going to be so much trouble if this happened on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. How many parenting books do you have in your house? About 40. About 40. How many parenting books have you actually read cover to cover? About four. Great. We're at a 10% success rate there. <laughs> I'm going to do an over under with other people on this. So we'll see how many we get. What's been your favorite age that your kids have been? It's right now. Everybody kept promising the golden period. And I was like, I don't know. I'm so tired. But I feel like it's really started to happen now. Eight and five. Okay, what about your least favorite age? What is the least favorite age for parenting? Kids. Zero, zero to one. And I'll say, even zero. if I was ready to be a good dad at that time, and as we discussed, I was not, they're fucking potato sacks. Like, there's not a lot going on. <laughs> okay, two more questions. What's your take on screen time? Oh, God. We try not to offer much of it, but I'm starting to wonder if we fetishized it by trying to limit it so much. And so, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I'm trying to limit it and figure it out. It's like the forbidden fruit now, right? Like, totally. uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, last question. Hot take on minivans. Good, bad, indifferent. Do you own a minivan? We are proud, proud waitlisters on the Rivian. And I can't Ooh. wait for it to come out. And I am so pro because if becoming a parent doesn't teach you to be practical, I don't know what will. Oh, awesome. The practicality of minivans. Love it. I did not know Rivian was making one. Maybe I'll get them to sponsor this. Bra brought to you by Rivian's minivan. <laughs> <laughs> Be a better dad. Buy a Rivian. And then one more time, that book that you mentioned was Secure Attachment. Secure Attachment is the idea, but Hold Me Tight is the name of the book. Okay. Just a quick advertisement for this book. This book helped me be a better parent. This book also helped me understand my childhood as well as my partner. I think it's a fantastic read. Awesome. I will have to check that out. Maybe that will be one of the hundred parenting books that I attempt to read and hopefully I finish. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. This has been awesome. Thank you for joining me and I will see you soon. Awesome. Take care. Thanks, Adam. That was a fantastic conversation with Nick Soman, CEO and founder of Decent Health. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show today, please subscribe, share, and leave me a review. It'll help other people find this podcast. Startup Dad is a Fishman AF production with editing support from Tommy Heron. You can stay up to date on all my thoughts on growth, product, and parenting by subscribing to the Fishman AF newsletter at www.fishmanafnewsletter.com. Thanks for listening and see you on the next episode.